committee will come to order. The domestic uh, policy subcommittee of the Committee on Government Oversight and uh, Reform will uh, come to order. Uh, this hearing today will examine the scientific evidence supporting treating drug addiction as a brain disease and the development and use of medications to treat addiction and assist in recovery. Uh, I'm uh, hopeful there will be other uh, members in attendance today. We're not only competing with uh, uh, General McChrystal today, but even more significantly, we're competing with the World Cup. So uh, uh, without, <laughs> without objection, the chair and ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. And without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. In its 2006 legislation authorizing the Office of National Drug Control Policy, Congress specified two main policy goals. One, reducing illicit drug consumption, and two, reducing the consequences of illicit drug use in the United States. But a neutral observer would have to conclude that this country's efforts to reduce drug consumption have largely failed. Rates of overall drug use have held steady, and so have the numbers of persons dependent on drugs and alcohol, a total of about 22 million people. It is estimated that 20 million people needed treatment for addiction in 2008 and did not receive it. U.S. demand for drugs fuels an international illicit drug industry. It is estimated that 70 to 80 percent of the demand for certain highly addictive drugs is created by just 20 to 30 percent of users. While we have spent billions of dollars a year trying to eradicate and intercept such drugs from coming to meet U.S. demands, the same cannot be said about our national efforts to curb demand where it begins with a biological basis for addiction. Instead, untreated drug and alcohol addiction overburdens our health care system, clogs our criminal justice system, with people who should be in treatment, not behind bars. As Dr. Nora Velkov of the National Institute on Drug Abuse will explain today, scientific research definitively shows that addiction is a treatable medical condition. Like people with any other medical condition, drug-addicted individuals need to have access to medications to treat the disease. By relieving withdrawal symptoms and reducing cravings, medicines have proven effective in helping individuals start and remain in behavioral therapy and achieve long-term recovery. We hear from several witnesses today on how medications help addicts and disengage from drug seeking and related criminal act, uh, behavior and become more productive members of society. Developing and using effective medications to treat addiction could make as big a difference in the individual lives of addicts as their widespread use could make a national drug control policy. The Obama administration and the National Drug uh, Control Policy, the Office of National Drug Control Policy, under Director Kilikowski and Deputy Director Tom McClellan's leadership, have taken a big step forward in U.S. drug policy by advocating for treating drug abuse as a public health issue. The 2010 National Drug Control Strategy supports the development of medications to treat addiction and recognizes that the effectiveness of addiction treatment has been hampered by the limited range of available medications relative to other chronic medical disorders. Indeed, while the work of the NIDA has brought important advances in medications development this decade, including medications to treat opiate addiction and alcoholism, much work remains to develop and bring more addiction medications to market. The number of medications available for treating addiction is far fewer than other chronic illnesses. Currently, there are no approved medications that treat cocaine or methamphetamine addiction, despite promising new discoveries and clinical trial data. While the scientific knowledge exists, it's not been translated into new medications. NIDA's budget, just over $1 billion, and a small fraction of the national drug control budget, is simply too small to do this work alone. NIDA needs more support from the federal government and the partnership of private industry to make progress. But developing medications for addiction treatment is currently of little interest to the pharmaceutical industry. We will hear today from one former and one current pharmaceutical executive whose company successfully partnered with NIDA to develop drugs to treat opiate addiction and alcoholism. They will address some of the market barriers private industry perceives to developing these medications and how the government can incentivize private industry to develop medications for drug abuse and addiction. 
I hope today's hearing will shed some light on the importance of treating addiction as a medical illness worthy of medications and how we can support NIDA and private industry in order to make possible the research and development of medications which could transform the way we treat addiction. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, now I uh, recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, uh, Mr. Jordan of Ohio. Thank you for being here, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for this hearing. Uh, from stronger enforcement of drug laws to treating those addicted to drugs, this country's commitment to fight the war on drugs is important and has taken on multiple forms. I applaud all the work and the efforts being made by those who are engaged in this struggle, particularly the individuals and families who struggle to combat addiction. It is the plight of these individuals which brings us here today to raise awareness of a new approach to fighting the war on drugs. Historically, this country has treated drug addiction through behavior modifications, for instance, through counseling, gradually through research grants issued by the NIH. Uh, science found drug addiction may, re, uh, may be a result of brain disease and not solely a result of behavior, a condition which can be treated through medication. As science changes our understanding about why people use drugs, the federal government need be, uh, needs to be careful not to endorse just one form of treatment over another, but instead support individual choices in the type of treatment that is most beneficial. Because just as we learned this week, sometimes the drugs used to treat the addicted become another form of addiction. On Monday, the CDC issued a report which found prescription drugs have overtaken illicit drug use uh, as the number one reason for overdose. Troublingly, the top three prescription drugs being abused, um, methadone uh, is uh, one of the most popular drugs used to treat drug addiction. However we treat addiction, we must have a strong partnership with the private sector. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for again holding this hearing, and I yield back the balance of my time. And I thank, the, I thank the gentleman for the points he just raised. I want to start by introducing our first panel. Uh, uh, a. Thomas McCollin, Ph.D., is currently Deputy Director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. As Deputy Director, Dr. McClellan serves as the primary advisor to the Director on a broad range of drug control issues and assists in the formulation and implementation of the President's National Drug Control Strategy. Dr. McClellan brings 35 years of addiction treatment research to the position, most recently at the Treatment Research Institute, a nonprofit organization that he co-founded in 1992 to transform the way science is used to understand substance abuse. Dr. McClellan's contributions to the advancement of substance abuse research and the application of these findings to treatment systems and public policy have changed the landscape of addiction science and improved the lives of countless Americans and their families. Dr. Nora Velkov, MD, is the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, that's the NIDA, at the National Institutes of Health, a position she has held since May of 2003. As a research psychiatrist and scientist, Dr. Velkov pioneered the use of brain imaging to investigate the toxic effects of drugs and their addictive properties. Her work has been instrumental in demonstrating that drug addiction is a disease of the human brain. Dr. Velkov has published more than 445 peer-reviewed articles and more than, 600, uh, and more than 60 book chapters. During her professional career, she was named recipient of multiple awards and was recently named uh, one of Time Magazine's top 100 people who shape our world. Uh, Dr. McClellan, uh, Dr. Velkov, thank you for appearing before the subcommittee. It is the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that you rise, uh, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Thank you. Uh, let the record reflect that uh, both of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. I would ask Dr. McClellan to begin and give a brief summary of your testimony. I, I, uh, doctor, I'd ask that you keep the testimony to under five minutes, uh, five minutes at most in, in length. Your, your entire statement is going to be included in the record and uh, it will be as much appreciated. I would like you to begin right now, and then we'll go to Dr. Velkov. Thank you, sir. Chairman Kucinich, <clears throat> Ranking Member Jordan, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to be, appear before you today, and I commend you for your attention to these critical public health issues that have been ignored for far too long. I'll begin with some definitions and facts about substance use derived from well-established science. This science will introduce what we think is a smarter way to address the nation's drug problems, including expanded use of approved medications through our 2010 uh, National Drug Control Strategy. Now, in this hearing, I will use the term substance to mean alcohol, 
street drugs such as heroin, cocaine, marijuana, and inhalants, but also pharmaceutical drugs such as opiates, sedatives, or stimulants that have not been used as prescribed. Now, approximately 23 million Americans suffer from either substance abuse or dependence, which threatens their health, productivity, and relationships, ultimately eroding inhibitory control, turning drug-seeking into a compulsion, and erasing motivation for normally pleasurable human relationships. Now, thanks to NIDA research, uh, we now know that this is a biological process characterized by progressive and long-lasting perturbations in the reward, motivation, attention, and inhibitory structures of the brain. In turn, we know that genetic heritability is a significant factor in determining who among those who use go on to ultimately become addicted. So while we do not have a cure for addictions, we can manage these illnesses with the same favorable results obtained in chronic asthma, hypertension, or diabetes. And I think that's important. Specifically, we now have several FDA-approved medications for the treatment of alcohol and opiate addiction. In addition, we have very promising early results from clinical trials of other medications and of cocaine vaccines that could markedly reduce relapse. But it's also a sad fact that the current addiction treatment system can barely incorporate even the already approved medications. The reasons for this are both conceptual and historical. When the original addiction treatment system was developed about 40 years ago, addiction was not considered a medical illness and thus addiction treatment was purposely segregated from the rest of medical care into then newly designed specialty treatment system, the so-called rehab programs. In 2007, there were about 13,600 uh, addiction treatment programs treating over 2 million individuals at a budget of about $21 billion, the great majority of which were public funds. Recent data indicate that less than 1% of these funds go toward medication-assisted therapies. Today, very few medical, nursing, or pharmacy schools provide even basic training in addiction treatment. Thus, only about half of uh, contemporary addiction treatment programs employ even a part-time physician, and less than 15% employ a nurse. Very few programs have a formulary a proper electronic health record, or even an affiliation with a medical center. These are the minimum requirements one needs for effective medical management with pharmaceuticals. Functionally, this means that physicians rarely make referrals or play a proper role in continuing care of recovering patients, as is so often the case with other illnesses. This is different from the rest of health care, and it is wrong. Thus, the National Drug Control Strategy will not just upgrade the existing specialty care system, though that is very important. It calls for unprecedented expansion of training for health care professionals as well as integration of early intervention and medicated, medication assisted treatments to the in the approximately 7,000 HRSA funded federally qualified health centers and in Indian health service clinics. These two federal systems treat about 22 million patients already and will provide an opportunity to properly implement medication-assisted treatments. I hope these introductory remarks provide a context for how we plan to expand medication-assisted treatment within the President's 2010 drug control strategies. I have to say at a personal level that for the first time in my 35-year career, we finally have effective interventions to prevent addiction before it starts, to arrest emerging cases of substance use, and to treat even serious cases of chronic addiction. We believe our strategy gives us a chance to use these interventions properly. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I also ask that you include my full written statement into the hearing record, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. McClellan. Dr. Volkov, you may proceed. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the subcommittee. I'm very appreciative as director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Uh, uh, to Dr. Dr. Volkov, could you pull that mic uh, yes, a little certainly. bit? Yes, certainly. I apologize. No, no, no don't, don't apologize. I'm going to ask staff that at the beginning, uh, before we start these hearings, just familiarize the witnesses with the mics. Thank you very much. You may proceed. I apologize because she no, did. No, please. My mistake. Go ahead. But <laughs> I do want problem. to thank you for the opportunity to bring to you the opportunities and roadblocks um, that have come ac across 
in the development of medications for the treatment of drug addiction. Uh, drug addiction, as you all recognize, have a massive impact in our country. Just from nicotine addiction itself, uh, we can account for 400,000 deaths every year. The economic costs are gigantic, half a trillion dollars. Thanks a lot. Half a trillion dollars, and that does not count uh, the individual losses as well family and society of those involved with drugs. Science has told us that drug addiction is a disease of the brain, that it is genetically determined, that the changes in the brain remain sometimes years after drug discontinuation, that it affects fundamental areas of the brain that enable us, for example, to exert control of our desires and emotion, which explains why a person that's addicted will compulsively take the drug despite catastrophic consequences to that person and their family. Um, however, from this knowledge we have also learned that there are specific targets that we can now manipulate through compounds that if properly translated into medications could transform the way we treat drug addiction and have the potential also of transforming the way we prevent it. I'm going to just cite three examples to get you a perspective of how exciting the field is. Number one, addiction vaccines. There is data now currently that vaccines that are targeted towards specific drugs can be uh, developed to generate antibodies that will neutralize the drug while it is in the blood, preventing its entrance in the brain. An example is a vaccine currently being in phase three for developed for nicotine addiction, which has been shown to dramatically reduce nicotine consumption, uh, either to complete abstinence or to uh, reduce the amount of cigarettes utilized. Similar efforts are being done in with cocaine vaccine and for a heroin vaccine. Second one uh, relates to a transformation on the way that medications are being delivered. An example is a medication, naltrexone, which actually completely interferes with the effects of opiate drugs like heroin of pain medications to get into the receptors in the brain. It has not been shown to be effective in heroin addiction because the patients just stopped taking it. Now, new methodologies have enabled to provide it in a depot formulation that lasts four weeks. And preliminary results have shown that it dramatically reduces heroin consumption, 90%, that it dramatically increases uh, uh, retention in treatment, 75%, and it decreases craving by 50%. And the third example has to do with combination of medications that may have been developed for other purposes. This strategy has been shown to be very effective in the treatment of many medical diseases, including cancer and HIV, and pre preliminary studies have proven its efficacy in the treatment of cocaine addiction and marijuana addiction, uh, for which there are no FDA-approved medications. However, as exciting as these uh, discoveries and strategies may be, there are serious obstacles that threaten to put the brakes on their development into therapeutics. One of them is the exorbitant cost to bring a medication into the clinic. It's estimated to be approximately $2 billion for bringing one medication into the clinic. Now, most of those costs are bared by the pharmaceutical industry for most of the medical illnesses in combination and in partnerships with the NIH. And this has been very successful. Just let's look at HIV. Since 1983, there's been 30 approved medications for the treatment of HIV that were possible because of the massive investments by pharmaceutical industry. Now let's contrast that with the number of medications that we currently have approved for nicotine, which is the drug for which pharma has made the biggest investments. Three approved drugs, nicotine replacement therapies, bupropion, vareniclin. So why is it that we have not had investment of the pharmaceutical industry in substance abuse disorders? There are many factors that have been cited. Among them is stigma, but very importantly, 
major economic disincentives. It is perceived that the market for addiction is small, when in fact it may not be. It is also clear that many of the substance abusers, because of the devastating effects of drugs, have lost their income, their work, and many of them are not properly insured. So how do we then revert this situation? Which is actually, by the way, made it even worse by the current decision of some of the major pharma in the world to actually decrease their investments on medication development for mental illness. Now, why would that even impact us in the drug abuse field? Uh, uh, doctor, I'm, I'm going to ask you to um, uh, conclude your testimony, and then we're, we're definitely going to get to you with questions that I think will help bring out the rest of it. Yes. So what we've seen is an, a massive amount of uh, development and uh, incredible opportunities to bring medication into fruition in the way that we treat and prevent drug addiction. For us to succeed, we need to create partnerships with the pharmaceutical industry. And with that, I want to thank you for the opportunity, and I, look for, uh, and I will answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, uh, Dr. Velkov. We've been joined by uh, Mr. Cummings of Maryland and Mr. Kennedy of Rhode Island. Uh, they'll be participating in the uh, questions of the witnesses. And I'm going to begin with the first round. Uh, Dr. McClellan, if we did treat drug addiction with evidence-based treatment, including effective medicines, and did so on a widespread basis, what effect do you think that would have on a wi wide-scale problem of illicit drug use, drug trafficking, and drug-related violence? Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, one of the best examples, uh, Congressman, is what's happening in AIDS. Um, we find that uh, aggressive treatment of AIDS not only is reducing the prevalence of AIDS, it's reducing the incidence of AIDS. That is, by reducing the number of people affected, you're reducing the number of people. Well, let me, let, me help focus, let me help focus this. Would, would it significantly cut our demand in the U.S. for illicit drugs if we had this um, evidence-based treatment? It, sorry, my hearing's not that good. W would, it, would it significantly cut demand in the U.S. for illicit drugs, for example? Uh, yes, I think it would cut and would it re Would it reduce the desirability of the U.S. market for, for uh, drug cartels and gangs? I think that's a plausible uh, uh, conclusion, yes. So, so based on your years of research, would you say that evidence-based treatment would make a demonstrable impact on society? Yes, definitely. So with so much uh, drug addiction and related societal costs and with so many actual medical treatments available and promising compounds for new medications, uh, it, it uh, uh, strikes me as being um, unfortunate that we're not fully invested in medication development and delivery on a broad scale. I, why, why, why is that? Why does that happen? Yeah, that's, it seems like a simple issue. Um, there are medications let's go buy them, let's put them in, into play, it'd be, it's a nice, simple solution. Unfortunately, this is a complicated issue. And really, there are four issues that complicate it. Um, and, and the first is insurance. Um, for too long, most of the people affected were not insured. Um, second, as uh, Dr. Volkoff said, and as I said in our, my opening testimony, um, another part is, is the workforce. We haven't had educated doctors, nurses, pharmacists. So um, that's been an important part. Third is stigma, the stigma of this illness. And combined, they do one thing and they do it profoundly. They affect the marketplace for pharmaceutical industries to get into this. If you don't have coverage to pay for the, Ill, the uh, diseases that, uh, the medications that would be developed, if you don't have a workforce that could prescribe it, and, and there's perceived stigma and, and, and problems, this is not the kind of place that most pharmaceutical companies have ventured in. Well, we think we can, can change that, and we, we have plans to. Uh, Dr. Velkov, it's been estimated that 70 to 80 percent of U.S. demand for illicit drugs is exercised by 20 to 30 percent of users, those who are addicts and chronic drug users. Are there currently medicines available to effectively treat those addicts and stop a significant proportion of them from using illicit drugs? And what scientific advances show promise for the near-term development of new 
effective medications and vaccines that could be used to treat the drug addicted population? Yes, they are. Uh, they are uh, very effective medications to treat heroin addiction. They are very effective medications to treat alcoholism. They are very effective medications to treat nicotine addiction. There are no medications approved for cocaine, marijuana, methamphetamine inhalants. What are the promising, to, in my view, one of the most promising findings has been the recognition that vaccines have as a, a, can work. There have been concern that these vaccines could lead to increased use to overcome the effects of the antibody. That did not materialize. And currently, in the, we will have results from the nicotine vaccine trial in the next two years. Do, do, you, have any, do you have any concerns that, uh, that this particular approach uh, could be over-reliant on a, a behaviorist model? My perspective is that behavioral interventions are extraordinarily important, and we don't need to choose a vaccine versus a behavioral. You use both. Drug addiction is a very serious condition, substance abuse, and you have to deal with it aggressively. So like with cancer, you do behavioral interventions and you do treatment medical interventions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Jordan. I thank the chairman, uh, and that that's, was my question or where I wanted to focus. And let me start with you, Dr. McClellan, and pass along our uh, best to Mr. Kurlikowski. He's been in front of the committee many times, and we appreciate uh, his work and your work. We've had this debate a little bit. Um, I think Sir, I'm very sorry. Would you mind turning your microphone? I can't hear. I'm sorry. Okay. We choose the other way around. We have the problem. Yeah. It's the first time we've had yeah. this way. Um, there's been this uh, s discussion in, in, your, um, uh, in your agency about treatment versus law enforcement and that debate. And now we, uh, we, we, we have kind of a, maybe even a step further, I guess you could say, in, in the question that the, the chairman just raised. Do, do you think in any way this a focus on using drugs to treat drug addiction um, in any way is diminishing the the affected person taking personal responsibility um, the, the, you know the, the idea of individual choice and some of the underlying concerns that may have prompted or, or maybe causes too strong a word or contributed to uh, the, the addiction in the first place yeah. That I mean, that, I think it's a right. legitimate concern that I, I know I have and raised it in some in my opening statement, and, and the chairman just referred to it. Yes, I, I noticed that in, in your statement. Um, if you imagine that drug addiction is a simply bad behavior, then you'd really be you want to be very careful that you don't do anything that would reinforce that bad behavior, or for God's sake, get other people to initiate it. But we know very clearly from a lot of research that uh, this country has already paid for, much of it done by my colleague, uh, Dr. Volkoff, addiction is not just bad behavior. Drug use is preventable behavior, and our strategy is very clear on wanting to prevent it because we can. But we don't know how, but we know that as use continues, a, a separate disease process takes over it erodes the ability to control that use. So we think the smart thing to do is prevent, is, prevent, is work very hard to reduce supply, uh, work very hard to prevent drug use from before it starts, get physicians to learn how to recognize and intervene early on the behaviors and on the, on the consequences of early drug use, but once addiction starts, you need medications, and it's important to add that. How do, um, well, a couple questions. How much money is our government currently spending to deal with drug problems in all the, the various agencies? And then kind of a, a second question, how do your agency and NIDA, how do you, the two agencies in front of us here, in front of the committee, how do you interact and, and collaborate and work together? I'm happy to have her give her uh, uh, perspective. Um, I, I don't want to give you an exact figure on the uh, amount that's uh, spent. It's uh, extreme. I can tell you there's about $22 billion that's been uh, spread out uh, sp over uh, HHS and with your, I mean, where, where's, where's it at? In a, in a broad, give me the general category. Uh, I'm most comfortable talking about the treatment of mm -hmm. uh, addiction, and um, it's in round numbers, $22 billion, about 80% of that coming from uh, 
the uh, federal government, really. Um, in terms of what we, how we interact, um, we are reacting in a really very collegial and, and collaborative manner. Uh, we are working with all of HHS to train new doctors, nurses, pharmacists. We are working as part of the health care reform package with HHS to get, for the first time, a benefit into health care reform that will enable doctors to get paid to treat and recognize, intervene and treat addiction. Uh, before it gets to the uh, point that it's out of control. And we're working very closely with NIDA to uh, uh, support new research, which is necessary to develop even more tools. Dr. Volkall, do you want to comment? Well, one, one of my perspectives as director of NIDA is that science that is not useful to improve the quality of life of uh, individuals is not worth doing. And uh, in our part, so the partnership with the other agencies is crucial. And we have had traditionally a very close relationship with ONDCP. Since ONDCP provides, uh, has the ability to integra inter integrate the actions of multiple agencies. So when there is a priority area, for example, as cited in the plan for the ONDCP, the increases in psychotherapeutic abuse in this country they come to us and says, this is one of our priorities. What is it that you can do from the science perspective to, to help reverse it? So at the very, very basis of how we make decisions of where we're going to fund research, we ba get information and uh, the, the, the needs of mm -hmm. ONDCP into account. Our budget, since you were speaking about budgets, just for research is a billion dollars, and that uh, relates to all of the drugs as well. Within that amount of money, 300 million set up for investment on HIV, since drug abuse contributes to it. There's another institute at the NIH that is involved with another addiction, alcoholism, and the budget of that agency is close to half a billion dollars. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, th I thank the uh, gentleman. Chair recognizes Mr. Cummings for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding this hearing. Um, both of you, it's good to see you all. Um, Dr. Volkow, you say in your testimony that ma many pharmaceutical uh, companies have traditionally shied away from medications development for illicit drug disorders because of a relatively small patient population who, is also, who also tend to be in lower uh, income brackets, uh, lack health insurance, or rely on the state for their care. With the recent passage of the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, it will, it's going to improve coverage for and access to services for substance abuse disorders in the same primary care settings as now services uh, all as now services all other illnesses, what are we doing to incentivize pharmaceutical companies to experiment and produce new drugs? Um, thanks for that question. Actually, it's a very relevant one, and it's a question that um, we had posed ourselves as um, in the health system 15 years ago. And the Institute of Medicine actually called in a committee to try to answer that question. How is it in, in the line of the urgency of developing medications, the opportunities, and the lack of investment from pharmaceutical that we can revert that trend? The Institute of Medicine came up with very specific recommendations that uh, would have unfortunately not been implemented. Uh, what are some of those uh, recommendations having to give, for example, protected market for a given medication? So those, those recommendations still apply. I think that in the meantime, though, there are many m much greater opportunities that you just cited. Um, many individuals did not have a way of paying, will now be able to do so. And that's why at this present moment, we have a unique opportunity to try to engage pharmaceutical into partnering in ways that will be beneficial for them and beneficial for the country. Um, if I may, yes. I, I would like to add to that an, another part, and that is training for physicians. 
um, physicians and nurses don't get the training they need in this illness and thus are not comfortable prescribing any medication. So another opportunity, in addition to the ones Dr. Volkoff talks about, is the work now going on to try to get uh, physicians, and particularly primary care physicians, to become um, uh, facile with these uh, new medications and, and have a basic understanding of these diseases. The, um, you know, there was just a recent article of about how difficult it is, how many uh, students, medical students, don't want to go into primary care. And of course, we have some things in that bill to try to incentivize. Um, but, you know, it, we've been dealing with these kind of issues for a long time. And the other the things, other than the things that you just said, um, how do we guarantee ourselves the, uh, rather than say going on a merry-go-round where we seem to make little progress, uh, how do we maximize the uh, probability of actually being effective and efficient with regard to the things you're talking about? Either one of you, or both. You go ahead. They, and there are two questions. One of them uh, that relates to the need to build infrastructure in the healthcare system. So when patients that now have insurance come for help for the treatment of drug addiction, there will be specialists that can actually take care of them. That's a crucial component. Oh, sorry. Second one is, which has been more complex, involvement of the pharmaceutical industry. And again, pharmaceutical, like any private industry, will be incentivized if there is a success with a given medication. So right now, with a new perspective with respect to vaccines development that I predict uh, will be successful with nicotine vaccine, I predict that that will incentivize other pharmaceuticals to go for treatments that are for licit substances. For the illicit substances, we still have a very limited market um, that integrates the involvement of private companies. Currently, as we speak, the Institute of Medicine is holding a conference to try to figure out ways in which we can sort of contain or reverse the disengagement of pharmaceutical, not on substance abuse, because they have not been very much involved, but on development of medications for depression, for schizophrenia, for anxiety, for mental illnesses. We've seen a decrease in the investments. And this would be catastrophic. And it's catastrophic for us because we take advantage of those medications that may be used for depression. In some instances, are useful for addiction. It's going to end at the end of the day by coming up with compromises on the way that we do things. The IOM already came about it. We need to incentivize pharmaceutical industry if we want to have these medications development, just like we incentivize for other needs. If the country needs tanks to go to war, we need to incentivize the companies that do them. Otherwise, spontaneously, it's not happened. This is urgent. Hundreds of thousands of people's lives are ruined because of drug addiction. It needs not be like that. We have the science. We know how to develop it. We just don't have the resources to get it to the next turn. I see my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair recognizes Mr. Kennedy. Welcome. Um, <clears throat> if you could uh, address the uh, point that I uh, want to make, and that is that we don't have an addiction treatment system whatsoever in our country. Um, personally, I've uh, made a very close personal analysis of treatment centers. I've gone to the best in the country myself, uh, Mayo, um, Ashley, Sierra Tucson, others. Um, it's all based upon a um, treating um, based upon your weaknesses instead of treating and based upon your strengths. And it's outside where you live, so it doesn't help you in the course of your life. Um, and our reimbursement system doesn't forget the specialties. All you really need if you're trying to stay in the wagon is to have someone in your life on a consistent basis help you. And I'm wondering to what extent have you 
allowed in the regulations that are now being done to implement parity the, to allow those with neurological disorders, and this is a neurological disorder because it's a chemical imbalance that people try to self-medicate to address, hence the reason we're talking about pharmaceuticals to help address. Are we doing something to allow insurance policies to pay for non-medical services, like having someone stay on top of you and making sure that you don't have this kind of quote, 90 and 90, there you go, we're off to your own, as opposed to someone has to have only acute episodic care, because that's the only thing that right. we have reimbursable under current insurance system. And it's so costly, and yet it's so ineffective. And why are we paying for it in this country? And it's the best that we have out there. It's the gold standard. And right. yet it's awful. Hmm. But I, uh, something that is painfully obvious to you is not clear to the rest of America, and that is that addiction is a disease and it's a chronic disease. Unfortunately, for a very long time, we've been thinking about this as bad behavior that needs an acute, rapid lesson in life. Well, if we treated diabetes or hypertension or asthma that way, we'd have terrible results. So. Two answers to your question. I think the very recognition that we've been thinking about this in the wrong way and, and segregating a treatment system away from the rest of medicine has not served us well. So we're, we're off of that and we're on to, I think, the right thinking and the right model. Now tell me, if, what are we going to do to certify treatment providers so people don't end up continuing right. to waste all their money on these everything out there that's right. so bad and not getting any results for their I, people. I, I want to say, and I'm, I'm sorry uh, Representative Cummings isn't here, I, 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 I do not feel the kind of uh, skepticism and um, worry that is uh, apparent in so much of the questioning. Um, this is a very good time. I think we've got it right and we're making real progress now. And to that question, um, we have got the attention of all the primary care medical societies. They have recognition that they need the kind of training that's necessary to properly certify them. We're working with the National Board of Medical Examiners to, at a fundamental level, test kids coming out of medical schools and other schools in, on these issues. Um, we Dr. are McLeod, including the benefit that will... I just got to get all this stuff on the yeah. record. Why don't we have an NCQA uh, an agency for healthcare research certifying these mental health providers and not certifying them because they're not doing what they're supposed to do. That shutting is a them down. Very good idea. Shutting them down so they're not wasting people's money anymore and pretending like they're giving people treatment when they're not. And having people instead, when they're spending their 30 grand a month, spending it over the course of a year to have someone in their lives that helps them in their own community. Why aren't we telling the insurers this is the model? Why aren't we doing it in the VA so that that's what they look for as the model? Yeah. Uh, uh, I think we're on the right track, uh, Congressman, and I think uh, you're going to see progress in, uh, very shortly in just that area. Well, we have an opportunity in the implementation of these regs on parity to actually reimburse for this model of care that's non-medical which is actually most productive for dealing with chronic illnesses of a neurological, and this helps people with autism, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, you know, everybody. So our fight is the fight for everybody, and I would make that point with respect to the IOM report on drugs. We don't need to incentivize pharmaceuticals. All we need to do is get everyone to double down on research of the brain. We'll find out that there are great answers for pharmaceuticals to go into treatment for depression and addiction, too but it'll come when everyone else is fighting for just basic research in neuroscience. You know, forget the silo of trying to get them to incentivize for drug addiction because you don't have the popular will to do that. That's just, I mean, I know Nora knows stigma well enough to know that's not gonna happen. I, I thank the gentleman. I just wanna say that we in the Congress are proud of uh, Representative Kennedy's courage and his advocacy and it's important for the nation. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, chair recognizes a uh, distinguished congresswoman from California, Ms. Watson. Thank you so much, 
Mr. Chairman, um, I can't think of a subject any more needed for attention than the one that we're addressing today because I think of some decades in the past and I represent Los Angeles and uh, our bus drivers were driving buses and the buses were turning over on the freeway without accidents. My nephew was a bus driver, so I said to him, what's going on out there? He said, most of the bus drivers are using crack cocaine. So I went to the supervisor and I said to him, you know what you need to do? You need to test because the lives of all of your employees and the lives of our citizens are at stake. And the people who are driving these buses are buying homes, have car notes, have children in school, and we just cannot throw them away. So they started to do random testing, but I put a bill in and so that we could have neighborhood, and I'm addressing this to my colleague, Mr. Kennedy, for some of the remarks he made, so we could have neighborhood treatment centers where people could walk in and get treatment. It got all the way up to the governor and he said that it's too expensive and vetoed the bill. Ever since then, we have the largest prison population in the country. And 50% of those incarcerated were addicted to drugs and they get very little treatment are not the right kind of treatment in these institutions. It has been a concern of mine forever. I chaired the Health and Human Services Committee in the Senate in California for 17 years. Every year we would put a bill in and uh, we couldn't get it funded. Now the state is broke. So I doubt if we'll ever have a program. So uh, what is the Office of National Drug Control Strategy for providing those who are incarcerated with the treatment they need to reduce reincarceration, relapse, and overdose rates, and what role should drug addiction medications play in this treatment? And this is to the two of you. I, I can think of no more important question. It's one of the key parts of our drug control strategy, partly because of the volume of the problem. Uh, the numbers of people affected and, and the importance. It also is a question that illustrates something that I, I think I'd like to make as a general comment. I'd be very careful about thinking of, of, of pitting one strategy, medication versus supply reduction versus behavioral treatment. We don't want to do that. We want it all. Comprehensive. And comprehensive and particularly for those populations where there's a combination of risk to the community as well as a public health risk. The good news is we can. There are effective things that can be done, have been shown, and we've put money in the 2011 budget to incentivize just those things through the uh, National Institute of Justice. Like what? Well, drug courts are an excellent example. The principles of drug courts, swift, certain sanctions, uh, but modest, combined with evidence-based treatment and prevention strategies give you the very best opportunity to, to fight with both hands, to use all the tools that you have. Um, we want to apply those principles in reentry. We want to apply those principles particularly in community-oriented corrections yeah. because there are so many, there are approximately, um, uh, we think, we use the same uh, uh, data you do, and we think about two and a half million people are in the community under corrections with a substance use problem. If they're not, if it's not addressed, it's going to lead to re-addiction, um, re-offense, re-incarceration, and a huge expense. Again, the good news is there are models out there that have been shown to work that reduce all of those things. Keep communities safe, reduce the drug use, save a lot of money. And just to make a point about medications in the criminal justice system, that's in an area where the evidence is so strong that in fact we don't need more evidence. Um, treating with medications in the, while in the criminal justice system and maintaining that treatment once the prisoner is released 
is not just significantly beneficial for the person vis-a-vis -vis their drug use, but it dramatically reduces the rate of reincarceration. So it's a win-win with respect to the drug abuse behavior and with respect to the criminal behavior. So it's not just cost effective, it is actually cost saving. If I may, uh, just one second more, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I represent an area in Los Angeles called Hollywood. And there's not a time when you read the newspapers, turn on your TV or your radio, to see some young celebrity involved with drugs. It is rampant in that community. And the reason why I said, Dr. Merlin, that we needed to look at a comprehensive approach because these people are dealing with psychological, emotional problems leading to their judge use, too much, too soon, too fast, too much fame, and so on. And so we have to have the right combination. And as my colleague, Mr. Kennedy, said, it needs to be close to home where we can deal with all the factors that impact on people in a community like this let alone uh, the poor, poverty-stricken communities and their use just to get away from their real lives. So we have to have that comprehensive that treats the whole person and the entire community at the same time. Thank you so very much. Thank you for the time, Mr. Chairman. Uh, th I thank the gentlelady. We're going to begin the uh, second round of questioning of the witnesses. We're going to begin with Mr. Kennedy for five minutes. You may proceed. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I can't emphasize enough the feeling of outrage I have about this treatment because you can think about your, this stuff till you're blue in the face you can learn about it till at the end of the world you can get all the emotional and psychological treatment till the end of the earth and it's not going to change your behavior and we don't have any behavioral changes going on in these treatment facilities no behavioral modification if you don't uh, change your behavior, your thinking won't change. It's the key. So you fill the, everybody up with a head full of uh, AA and uh, program and treatment, and it's not going to do them a bit of good because you send them out, they're thinking a different thing, but they're still acting the way they were when they went in. It's so basic, and yet we're doing it everywhere. I mean, and the problem with all of this is that we have this stigma and it's just being perpetuated right now because all we're doing is talking about understandably the symptoms and people incarcerated and people on crack driving buses and blah blah blah. The bottom line is um, the biggest challenge going forward is narcotic analgesics are the biggest prescribed drugs in this country and our veterans are being prescribed this at record rates to deal with the symptoms of the signature wound on this war, TBI and PTSD. We shouldn't at all in this hearing be talking about criminal justice, you know, all of these stigmatized drugs. We should be talking about people self-medicating and we should be focusing on the people that everybody understands are self-medicating because of their service to our country. Because that destigmatizes it and people get it. And it's a huge problem, it's going to get bigger. And our fight is, should be the fight for our veteran. And if we can't even get it right in the VA, which is clearly, where they don't even have metrics for this. I'm wondering, what are we doing? I mean, we can't, every vision to vision has different approaches. They're just writing. They're, it's just, where are we? And if we can't get it right with these regs that we're trying to put in place now for this health bill, 72% of all vets are never going to see in the VA. They're going to get their health care through this private insurance plan. That health care bill was a veteran's bill. Of the remaining 28%, 67% of them are also going to get supplemental private health insurance coverage. What are we doing to make sure those private health plans are sensitive to veterans' needs and dealing with wraparound services for their brain trauma so they're not self-medicating because of the trauma and the brain uh, damage? We address that 
We do research on neuroscience for the veteran. Believe me, pharma's going to come to the table on all of the other things because we're going to get all the mo extra money we need to deal with brain issues. And in the process, we're going to find out about treating depression, treating addiction, treating everything else. We go at it this way that we're talking about now, trying to deal with the return, the recidivism for convictions, all that. Yeah, it makes sense for us on the budget. It makes sense for us on a human level. But it just doesn't make sense politically. And we're fooling ourselves if we're going to spend any time talking about it and thinking we're going to go anywhere, especially in this environment of austere budgets. So what I want to know is why aren't we getting our act together with the VA? And why aren't we getting our act together with implementing regs that actually do supportive living, supportive employment, and supportive education so people can live with the chronic illness over life as opposed to paying hundreds and hundreds of millions, billions of dollars in these no-win treatment settings that are gold-plated losers in terms of helping people perpetuate their thought, thinking they're getting treatment when they're not. I mean, we're sitting here. I mean, no offense, you're, we're talking, you just said that's a very good question, but it doesn't address the big picture. This is the big picture. We're not getting a right implementation of the regs, and we're not doing it at the VA, which is where all of the insurers take their lesson from. How are we going to get anywhere if we don't do it the right in those two places? Well, one, one of the things that I, I was thinking is that we are going to be faced with the veterans returning from this war with problems that in medicine we have not really addressed in the past. The level of uh, trauma that they are surviving will very undoubtedly lead to many more cases of chronic, severe chronic pain. Number one. Number two, you mentioned TBI, which is all, also something that in, in many ways this war has exposed us to. So we don't even have sufficient knowledge on how to treat these conditions. For chronic pain, we use opiate analgesics and it, we treat it as if it were acute pain times so many months. We have thought in the past that that will prevent from these individuals to get addicted to their pain medication. We're finding otherwise. So one of the areas that we are investing as an, as an institute is to develop medications and knowledge regarding the treatment and management of chronic pain to minimize the likelihood that those individuals become addicted to their medication and that they can control their pain. But we do not, at this point, have sufficient knowledge. Well, Dr. Steinberg at Stanford University, head of neuroscience, says he does. He says he can interrupt the neuropathways to block pain. I said, why aren't you introducing it? He says, I'm about to in the VA system at the Stanford, and then hopefully they can take it nationwide. The neuroscience that's going on in this country is breakthrough. The notion that we can't start to uh, cut the pathways to pain and treat it without doing these, neuro these narcotic analgesics and hook a whole generation of vets is shameful on us as a country that we're about to addict all these people and then send them off to do other illicit drugs like heroin and the rest when they're not getting enough narcotics from their docs. I mean, it just, to me, we're missing the big picture again. And I agree, and it's a priority area for our institute. I mean, if you want to talk about addiction, let's talk about what we're doing to addict a whole generation of American heroes. We're leaving them prisoners in our country stranded behind the enemy lines of their signature wound on the war. They are being held hostage right now by this disease because we're not treating it right. This has got nothing to do with cracks, addicts in California driving buses or prisoners in prison. This is about our American heroes. Let's keep it that way. Because if we do, we can move forward on this. If we start talking about everything else, we're losing it. Our fight is neuroscience. It's with those with Alzheimer's, autism, epilepsy, Parkinson's, because it's all the same brain. Once we do research on that, we're going to get pharma to come to the table. And we need to do neuroscience research, and they'll all see the, they'll see the great discoveries, and they're going to want to be at the table because they're going to realize there are going to be answers to all these other neurological disorders. 
And if we do the implementation for treatment right for addiction, guess what? It's right for those with Alzheimer's, right for those with Parkinson's, right for those with autism. Why aren't we getting this in the regs now and just segmenting it for neurological disorders in this parity regs? Patrick, I'm going to answer you because this is exactly, I mean, and I, and I really admire your, your passion. But I'm sitting down and listening that Pfizer Wyatt got rid of a thousand neuroscientists. I'm listening, Glaxo Court basically closed their um, psychotherapeutic development program. I'm seeing that Merck is also downsizing. I'm hearing that Lilly is also downsizing, despite all of the advances in neuroscience. And it is because they have not been very successful on bringing medications into the clinic. Many factors account to it. One of them is cost, but is they have not been very successful at all. There are other areas where medications, they have been able to get investments back, like cardiovascular disease. But psychotherapeutics has been an area that many of the pharma are starting to cut. And that's why I brought it up, because I think that we all as a country are go going to lose enormously if that continues to happen, if we don't contain it. Well, I, my point would be, you get Office of Management and Budget, and they look at this bill, they see we're on the hook for everybody with neurological disorders. The cost for Alzheimer's is going to skyrocket. We're all paying for it. Autism, skyrocket. Parkinson's, epilepsy, and now the veterans population with TBI and PTSD, we're on the hook as Uncle Sam big time. We had better invest or else we're going to be paying through the back end. So it's going to pay for us as a government to step up and do the down payment on research on neuroscience or else we're going to be paying through the back end. And it's, this is where we need the IOM to say to the federal government, here's a way out. If we're going to have cost effective, comparative effective analysis in this bill, here's where it counts. Comparative effective analysis shows if we research this stuff here, we're going to get interventions that are going to make a huge difference in just putting off the, the uh, onset of Alzheimer's, mitigating the impact of autism, you know, mitigating the impact of schizophrenia, allowing these vets, which we're already able to do, to repair spinal cords so they can get out of their wheelchairs and get into society. And, I mean, for us to think not, for us not to think big and think that the addiction field is there with Alzheimer's, autism, and all the rest. Think as one mind with the brain and not think big. Pharma's going to come if we get one picture on this and the vision. I, I think so. And I mean, I just, I, I think if you define it that a neuroscientist gave me one more year with my dad. Neuroscientist is going to give a family with Alzheimer's bring the memory back for their loved one. A neuroscientist is going to help a family with a kid with autism or Parkinson's, you know, or schizophrenia to w not have to worry as much while that child grows up about them being marginalized in society. They're, they're our first responders in this war on the biggest burden of illness, which is neurological disorders. They're going to set us free. These neuroscientists are going to go in there and they're going to set us free. First and foremost, our veterans. If we can't get that message across, we don't deserve to be in our business. I mean, these, this is it. This is going to save people's lives in huge ways. We're, we're in the weeds here. We're in the weeds right now. I, I agree, and that's one of the reasons why I'm very grateful to be here and, and being able to present uh, the obstacles that we are facing. And, I will definitely, since the meeting is ongoing right now at the IOM, um, highlight your point and your, your request that the IOM come up with very specific uh, points and that can be used to guide how to revert these changes that we're seeing in the pharmaceutical companies. And I will also, for the record, be willing to provide the committee with the information regarding um, the disinvestment, the decrease in investments from pharmaceutical industry for psychotherapeutics. I think we need to be aware of this. I'd like to I just, just get that answer on functional reimbursement for people in neurological disorder in this parity bill. I mean, you, right. you all at ONDCP, at NIH, the experts in the field have to weigh in. 
with HHS. The comment period's still open. If we don't reimburse for right. continued support for chronic illnesses, addiction's one of them, but all the others that I just mentioned are also them, we're missing the change from sick care to health care. We're missing a big opportunity. I, I would just add that you're, historically you got a terrific precedent on your side as I was around when the first addiction treatment system was developed and it was developed to treat the then uh, opiate problems of returning veterans from a foreign war. If that hadn't happened, there would have been no political will to create that system. Well, we need to advance beyond that. As you have said, th the science is there. Um, I think I agree with you. It, uh, absolutely, veterans need to have the same kind of care for their neurological and behavioral problems that they have for their cardiovascular problems. Now they don't. If we follow our strategy, if we uh, vigorously defend parity and vigorously implement the health care reform, they will have that chance. I, I think uh, one of the uh, things that the uh, uh, gentleman's question brings up is uh, where are we with respect to non-narcotic, uh, non-addictive pain relief. Um, that, that's a, I thank the gentleman for his questions. Uh, I am uh, going to recognize Ms. Watson if she would like to. Uh, okay, I, I, well, I'm, I just have, uh, I'll take my uh, five minutes right now. Uh, Dr. McClellan, we, we heard from Dr. Velkov that it's cost-effective to treat prisoners with medications while in prison and before release to prevent relapse and recidivism. Does the administration have plans to expand access to medications in the criminal justice system? Uh, yes. Um, we have plans to expand that access in prisons, but also in community for uh, individuals who are who jointly have criminal justice problems that are associated with their addiction as well as the addiction itself so we we don't just want to do it in 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 jails or prisons we want to do it for people who are uh, under parole and probation we want to do it for people who are re-entering and yes there are provisions through the National Institute of Justice and building upon the evidence-based uh, uh, behavioral interventions but also the medications um, that Dr. Volkov spoke of. Uh, thank you. D Dr. Volkov, uh, in terms of uh, neural research, once uh, uh, pathways are developed uh, through addiction and a person kicks their habit, Do those pathways still exist as, uh, uh, um, in a way that can inform other types of repetitive behaviors that are not necessarily, uh, um, th that, are, that are in effect, a, uh, that are a side effect, not, notwithstanding uh, their um, kicking their drug habit. Uh, and that's actually a very important question. And many investigators have tried to address the, the concept, well, how long do the brain changes last after you stop taking the drug? And w if they do not revert back to normal, what are the consequences on behavior, which is one of, I think, your very specific question. What research shows is that there is significant variability in terms of the ability of the human brain to recover. In some cases, you see almost complete biochemical recovery of the abnormalities, and in others, you don't. And when you don't see the, the recovery, what you do see is the arrangement and an increased reactivity to stress on people that have been addicted to drugs even years after they've stopped taking them. And this, of course, puts them at much greater risk to relapse because if they encounter an adverse situation, like losing their job or losing, the lo loss, loss, losing someone they love, 
that is a period of great risk for relapse because of the enhanced sensitivity to stress that was developed from the chronic use of drugs. Uh, in the case of alcohol abuse, someone who is a um, long-term alcoholic uh, can develop what's known as um, an encephalopathy that is really an, or an organic change in, in the brain. Uh, what does the research show about, a, um, about parallel organic brain syndromes with respect to drug addiction and the, um, uh, and the ability of the human brain to, uh, to recover? Well, they, they are, that depend, I mean, there are differences among the drugs. Some of the drugs are more toxic than others. Among the most toxic drugs, we have methamphetamine. Methamphetamine, with repeated use, can produce damage of cells, like the dopamine cells, that are very important in your ability to perceive pleasure and excitement. So the repeated use of these drugs can lead individuals, even years after they've stopped taking the drug, with a lack of excitement, with uh, what we call in psychiatry anhedonia, the ability to perceive pleasure, with a lack of motivation. What about, what about, what about cocaine addiction? What, what, uh, what's the uh, physiology in terms of, of uh, cocaine addiction and what, what damage is done? The damage from cocaine comes from an effect of cocaine on blood vessels. It is um, a vasoconstrictor, and that means it decreases the flow to your heart, it decreases the flow to the brain. And that's why we started to see uh, myocardial infarcts in young people when they were taking cocaine. But that also happens in your brain. When L that long happens- term, Long term effect. When you have damage from lack of blood into your brain, that can be long lasting. And if the cells are dead, they will be, there's no way that you can actually bring them back. What you can do is exactly- well, what, about, what, about, what about behavioral effects? Behavioral effects. Long term. With cocaine, if you have a stroke in the motor areas of the brain, that will leave you paralyzed and you will not necessarily recover your full motion. If you have it in the back of your head where you see vision, that could leave you blind. If you have it in an area that's involved with more silence type of behaviors like thinking, that will lead to disruption in thinking. So it's a matter, almost like a roulette. Where do you have the stroke in your brain that's produced from the effect of cocaine? that will lead to the symptoms. There is recovery though, and we know that the adult brain can recover even from strokes. And what happens is that rest of the brain can take over. The younger you are, the better your prognosis because your, your brain is more plastic. But the adult brain can still recover by engaging other areas of the brain to take that activity. So even with strokes from drug use, we expect recovery on those patients if they receive proper treatment. And I'd, I'd like to add something that's uh, less perceived but as insidious. Um, people wonder why after long periods of time, let's say an incarceration, a person would use a drug. Haven't they lost, learned their lesson? Don't they realize drugs are bad? Don't tell me that it's brain changes that do that. And the answer is yes, it is brain changes. We know that cues that have been associated with drug use people, places, things, um, have the ability not just to remind somebody about drug use, they have the ability to elicit the same changes as the drugs themselves in the brain. They light up, Dr. Volkoff's work has shown, they light up the same structures of the brain. They produce powerful craving they, even they when you haven't used. They I, I, what do you mean, they? They is any, any stimulus that's been associated with drug use. I come out of jail. I haven't used cocaine for a long time. I run into Joey and Billy, the guys I used to use cocaine with. Not only do I know, because my mother told me so, these are not the guys to hang around with. That elicits powerful craving uh, that you can show in an MRI. And, and that is part of the reason relapse rates are as high as they are. They are brain changes brought, behavioral changes brought about through learned associations. Oh, I, you know, we've heard of research where uh, women who are pregnant, who are drug addicted, 
that it has an effect on the on on the uh, fetus, the the child. Is that correct? That's correct. So so would so would then uh, medic uh, pharmaceutical related treatments block those receptors in the uh, in, in the fetus or newborn as well. Incredibly important question. Uh, drugs of abuse enter the fetus brain, and psychotherapeutics will also enter the fetus brain. What we do not know sufficiently is the extent to which some of these psychotherapeutics could also be potentially harmful for the fetus. Take an example, nicotine replacement therapy for smoking cessation. On a woman that's pregnant, nicotine is teratogenic. It produces damage to the brain of the infant. If you give a nicotine replacement therapy, the nicotine will go into the fetus and affect it. So the handling of the substance abuser that's pregnant with medication is an area that requires specific research on any one given medication to ensure that we will not do damage. Right. Uh, let me. Uh conclude this panel with one question. It's kind of an obvious question. It may not get asked that often because it is so obvious. Um, but I'd like to hear an answer from both of you. Why do we have this tremendous number of people who are on drugs? I mean, why? What is, what is, what's happened in our society what are the, what's, why? I mean, you must ask yourself, even uh -huh. as you're trying to deal with the, the mechanics of treatment, why? What do you think? Why, is, why do we have this kind of widespread drug abuse? I'd like to hear Tom's thoughts on oh, this. Boy, <laughs> you are talking to the wrong guy. I am, I've devoted my whole life to this, and my family is riddled with it, and I'm worried every moment of every day about my grandsons. Here is my answer. I'll tell you what I know and I'll tell you what I think. What I know is drug use is different than drug addiction. Drug use is a function of availability, access, ease of uh, uh, availability, like any other attractive commodity. If you make more candy bars available, more people use candy bars. That is a fact. Second, another thing I know is that ab abuse and addiction is a partially a function of genetics. We don't know how much, but we know that it contributes about the same amount of uh, expression of illness as genetics contribute to the expression of diabetes, hypertension, and asthma. So when you have an extremely wealthy country that has an abundance of access to drugs of different types, of different varieties, you have more opportunities to use and more people who are using. Once that happens, the disease process, the, you know, uh, the disease of addiction as well as the, the, the side effects of drunk driving and accidents and all the other sequelae of just simple use take effect. That's why as a guy who does treatment for treatment research my whole life, I don't want to just see treatment be the only answer um, to the drug problem. We need supply reduction as well as many more medications and much better prevention. That's everything I know. That's what I tell my grandkids right there. So, D Dr. Velkov. Yeah, no, and, and I why? think that there are many reasons that why we have uh, people end up taking drugs and becoming addicted. The issue of availability is a crucial factor. The more a substance is available, the more the probability that kids will start using it. And the younger you start using drugs, right. the greater your risk to become addicted. That's number one. Number two, we also, of course, recognize the issue of genetics. So if you come from a family where there is a history of addiction, which I also have in my family, then you are more vulnerable to become addicted. Three, there's another factor that we know that contributes, and that's Almost any type of mental disorder will increase your vulnerability to taking drugs, and that can be depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, attention deficit disorder. Why? Because you may then use the medication, the drug, not just 
to get high, but to feel better. And in fact, in this country, for example, those that remain as smokers, there is a great overrepresentation of individuals with mental illness. So a mental disorder will put you at greater risk. So those are three factors that are biologically that will increase your vulnerability. Now, why is it, if it is genetic, and this is a more basic question, why is it that those genes remain if they are, have these adverse negative consequences? And of course, that's a very fascinating question with respect to why is it that some people become compulsive users and cannot stop it? That plays to basic understanding about how the, the brain creates memories, how it, some people can learn faster than others. Well, that may come to a certain price. So this plasticity of the brain is one of the factors that contributes to that vulnerability of addiction. But that plasticity also is extraordinarily important in allowing us to learn. You know, um, th this, is, this has been a, a very important discussion. And it, uh, uh, we're, I saw Mr. Cummings uh, came back. Uh, and Ms. Watson has not asked questions this round. Before we dismiss this panel, do you, uh, uh, Madam, uh, uh, have Could a question. you yield for just a moment? Well, well I will, and also yes. Mr. Cummings, because I, I yes. just there there are questions that are very deep here, and I just want to make sure that the members of Congress who are present have a chance. We're about to dismiss this panel, but before we do, do, do you have a final? Uh, coincidentally, uh, I have an appointment at 2:30 today with Erica Christensen. She is an actress, and uh, she's. Uh, in my district in Hollywood now. And her mission on the Hill today is to promote the importance of substance abuse education uh, and to talk about it as a crime uh, preventative tool and the importance of treatment and front end diversion as a way to reduce the recidivism uh, rates of offenders who are already in the criminal justice system. I just asked my staff to see if we could locate her in the building now. She'll be here today and tomorrow and see if she could come at the end of the second panel. Uh, would, you know, without objection, that would be fine. Thank uh, you. And Mr. Cummings, do you have any? I do, yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, mean, I just want to just pick up on where you left off. Um, I, I live in the inner city of Baltimore, inner city, and have been there for all, all my life. And I see a lot of uh, young people who I have known since they were toddlers. Uh, some of them, sadly, have grown up to be drug addicted. Others have gone on to go college and done well. And I'm always curious as to how they got into it. And when I talked, and Dr. Vokal, when I was listening to what you was just saying a moment ago, you talked about the mental illness part. And I know that there's something called clinical depression. And I assume there are other kinds of depression too. But um, I noticed that a lot of these young people don't have a sense of hope. I'm just telling you. They don't. It's hard for them to see a future. A lot of the young women tell me that they've got, they got involved in drugs because of some young man. Uh, trying to impress somebody, some guy, he uh, talks them into it. Oh, it's just only take one time and you'll be fine. And the next thing you know, uh, she's in pretty bad shape. Uh, there are, and then, you know, and, and the thing that I, get, I guess that really gets me is how how drugs can change a person drastically from a person who may have been honest to someone who lies all the time, for someone who has never stolen anything to someone who will steal, from, some, from someone who never thought about harming another person to someone who will kill someone. Uh, I tell people quite often, while I, I love my neighborhood, Quite often, most of the time, I sleep better outside of my neighborhood than in my neighborhood 
because I realize that a lot of the very young people that I watch grow up with that'll say, oh, Mr. Cummings, how you doing? Show a lot of respect. Having been a criminal lawyer, I can tell you, I know that if, in certain circumstances, uh, they could harm me. As a matter of fact, my predecessor, Perrin Mitchell, uh, who was well respected, uh, he, he was robbed at least three or four times. And we lived literally in the same neighborhood. So, and by the way, by the same young people that had a phenomenal, phenomenal amount of respect for him. And I guess I, my question goes to, is there, I mean, you know, you talk about mental illness. We see people who spend thousands upon thousands of dollars uh, every year to address mental illness. So we've got, but yet and still, it seems like a, not a lot with regard to mental illness is addressed when we give somebody uh, a medication or whatever. Are we balancing that? Or has our society come to even accept the fact that uh, drug addiction is usually accompanied by some type of, of mental problem? And, and the reason why I started off the way I started off this question is because, you know, a lot of times people may have a problem, but it may not be classified as mental illness. Because I, I believe you can be I believe you can be so depressed over your circumstances that you don't even know you are, you may have a mental problem. And so I'm just wondering, you know, I just want your reaction to that and then that's all I want to, I'm finished. Yes, and I think that that's absolutely correct. And indeed, one of the recommendations that we did as an agency was to start with, for example, young people that end up in the criminal justice system with a problem of drugs, that they be evaluated for the possibility that they may have a psychiatric disorder that has not been recognized. And indeed, on the recognition of mental illness in adolescence, where it's not full blown as you see it in an adult, is not an easy thing to do. And so many kids go around feeling depressed with a learning disorder and taking drugs without realizing why they are doing it. So that, that, is, that is something that we can address. Then your second question, because that's a problem that we have in the country that should be taken care of, which is we basically separate the divorce, the treatment of drug abuse from the treatment of mental illness. Right. I'm a psychiatrist. I was trained at New York University. I was not trained to deal with the substance abuse pa uh, problems of my mentally ill patients, even though 85% of them suffers from some type of addiction behavior. So we've separated the care of substance abuse from that of mental illness rather than integrating, because guess what? It comes together in both directions. So if you take drugs, that may increase your vulnerability for a mental illness. If you have a, another mental illness like depression, that increases your vulnerability for substance use disorder. So this is something that we need to change, the way that we are providing for the education of psychiatry and the treatment of individuals with mental illness and or substance use disorders and or comorbid conditions. And, and if I could just contribute. I, I I, I want to answer as a scientist, and I want to answer as another guy who lives in the middle of uh, a city, Philadelphia. And I don't want to leave the hearing with this kind of bleak idea that there's nothing we can do. Just the opposite, okay? But I'll, I'll tell you if, you, if you're really asking, as I ask myself so often, how come I can't tell who's going to get this? How come I couldn't stop it? How come I couldn't help one of these young people that you're talking about? And, and I think science tells us something there you have a role as a neighbor, you have a role as a, f as a parent, you have a role as a school teacher, you have a role as a policeman, a health care provider. None of those parts can do it by themselves and that's what we've been trying to do for too long. One of the things we've seen in science and one of the ways we're trying to uh, correct it is we want to stop quite literally buying prevention and treatment things that are just pieces of the real piece, of the real um, effective element. We want to bring prevention prepared communities together, Baltimore, Philadelphia, everywhere, so where all the parts are working together. All the parts are able to see these kids, not just when they start to use, but as, as other problems start to emerge. And we can do that, and, and it's time that we do it. 
And the last thing I want to uh, leave you with is, is another thing that's, that's more hopeful and, and something we haven't talked about. Yes, these illnesses are devastating. They're terribly costly. They're, 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 they ruin lives. They ruin communities. But there's hope. There are 20 million people now in that label themselves as being in stable recovery. More. So it is possible, and in fact, we think it's expectable. Treatment ought to lead to recovery, and it can. One of the reasons we're talking about medications and brain science and bringing all this together is with those new tools, we'll make that number 40 million and ultimately 60 million. Thank so you. I don't want to leave the hearing with kind of, oh my God, there's nothing we can do. We can do things, and this is the time to do them. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. You had a I just want to thank both of you for the great work you do. Um, my um, enthusiasm and questioning you is just to get my Absolutely. point across. I just sure. can't thank you enough, Dr. McClellan, for the professional development trying to get these state boards changed so we get more people in the healthcare field knowledgeable so they can diagnose and treat these illnesses. And Dr. Volkoff, your, you know, great work over the years in, in research has been so instrumental in moving it forward. Uh, I, I look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you so much for your work, both of you. Th thank you uh, very much, Mr. Kennedy and uh, members of the panel for participating uh, in this uh, uh, discussion and hearing from our expert witnesses. Uh, this, this hearing is necessarily focused on what kinds of medication might be available based on years of research in neuroscience that would uh, help to that would help people uh, deal with their addictions uh, but I am fully aware that there are other ways and other therapies that could be adjunctive um, and complementary uh, we have not really spent much time discussing them today although our witnesses have uh, acknowledged that they're looking at a broad spectrum approach towards addiction and not advocating just one uh, approach. Uh, be because just one approach, if we're talking about uh, drug therapy, would, would be ad admittedly a, um, a behaviorist approach that would be um, uh, mechanistic. If we're talking only about genetics, it's, it tends to be uh, mechanistic, it's stimulus response. Uh, we get into stimulus response uh, uh, psychology. We get into um, more of a behaviorist psychology than as opposed to humanistic psychology. We get into a, a, a neuropsychiatric uh, model uh, as opposed to something that maybe Menager would have done years ago, uh, looking at the, uh, at the bridge between um, uh, science and religion, between physics and metaphysics, be uh, into um, into looking at uh, the potential of the human spirit for transformation. Because there's another element here that we really haven't probed at all. That gets out of the psychology of victimization. That goes to what happens when someone does take responsibility and maybe connects with spiritual principles in their own life that help them to transcend their, their dilemma. We didn't get into that today. Uh, but uh, given this discussion, I think at some point uh, this subcommittee will. I want to thank the witnesses. And uh, we're now going to move to the next panel. Thank you very much.